Hello, and welcome to the first episode of our podcast, Mindful. I'm Jenny. And I'm Jess. Let's start off our session by bringing ourselves into the present moment. When you hear the mindfulness bell, we're going to take a deep breath, in through the nose, and then exhaling out through the mouth, sighing out any tension you've been holding on to. I don't know about you, Jenny, but whenever I'm feeling anxious, I practice some breathing exercises. I agree that breathing exercises are a great way to become aware of your body and the time and space that you're currently in. It allows for you to become mindful of what's going on currently instead of worrying about something that already happened or has yet to happen, hence the name of our podcast. Good point, Jenny. So to our listeners, to provide a bit of a background, both of us studied psychology in our undergrads and are both currently teacher candidates completing our Bachelor of Education at Ontario Tech University. Jess and I have previously discussed that we have always gravitated toward working with children and understanding their development and finding ways to help strengthen their mental health. So that leads us to what we're going to be talking about today, how to support student mental health in our classrooms. According to special education in Ontario, kindergarten to grade 12, the Education Act identifies five categories of exceptionalities for exceptional students, behavioral, communicational, intellectual, physical, and multiple. These broad categories are designed to address the wide range of conditions that may affect a student's ability to learn and are meant to be inclusive of all medical conditions, whether diagnosed or not, that can lead to particular types of learning difficulties. I don't know about you, but there are a few parts of that explanation that don't sit well with me. For example, it was stated that these categories are designed to be inclusive of all medical conditions, but can you think of anything else that could be considered a condition that can affect a student's ability to learn? What about mental illness, like anxiety? Medically speaking, anxiety is an emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes like increased blood pressure, and is one of the most common mental health issues, affecting one in 10 Canadians. As we dive into our discussion about mental illness, it's important to note that anxiety is a very normal and natural emotion that we all experience. We all feel anxious from time to time, and in many cases, it's perfectly normal. However, as teachers, it is important for us to be mindful of when anxiety becomes a problem for our students. The only mention of mental illness is within the behavioral exceptionality, which is classified as a learning disorder characterized by specific behavior problems over such a period of time and to such a marked degree, and of such a nature as to adversely affect educational performance, and that may be accompanied by one or more of the following. The inability to build or to maintain interpersonal relationships, excessive fears or anxieties, a tendency to compulsive reaction, and an inability to learn that cannot be traced to intellectual, sensory, or other health factors or any combination thereof. You may be thinking, yeah, that seems pretty encompassing of someone with a mental illness, but as someone with a mental illness, this is not even explicitly being addressed. What about students who don't fit into these specified categories? Without the clear cut mentioning of students struggling with mental illness, teachers who don't take the extra time to get to know their students or who are unaware of the symptoms of mental illness, they will not be able to accommodate these students' needs. You're right, Jenny. Even those who do not have firsthand experience with mental illness themselves might need more insight on how to support these students. Anxiety can be an invisible disorder, especially to a busy teacher. You also mentioned how you yourself, Jenny, struggle with your mental health. Can you elaborate? I personally am a very anxious person and often consider this as I move towards the teaching profession. You might have noticed that I did not say that I have anxiety, but rather am an anxious person. I have noticed that I do this and think I might be avoiding the label. While I would never wish the feelings of anxiety upon anyone, having students in our classroom who struggle with anxiety is inevitable, and I do think about how my own experience will allow me to go beyond these categories that we've mentioned in terms of understanding and being able to empathize with them. I appreciate that you're able to use your experiences with anxiety to help others. I have quite a bit of experience with mental illness myself. I was diagnosed with depression in grade 10. I was unable to concentrate, couldn't retain information, and felt numb. Up until that point, I was a great student, high grades, always participating, and was great at putting on a brave face. However, as my depression got worse, I was unable to cope with school. Uh, None of my teachers were aware of this, meaning I did not have any support. This led me to dropping out of school for the last four months of the school year. My mom was able to coordinate for me to get homeschooled and do summer school to catch up. Reflecting back on this and relating this experience to my current journey of becoming a teacher, it shouldn't take dropping out of school, or worse, for a teacher to realize that their student is struggling. Wow. 
Thank you for sharing, Jenny. It just goes to show that mental health issues will not just present themselves in a behavioral way, meaning that the exceptionalities categories, as mentioned, are not inclusive of every condition that can affect students' learning when it comes to their mental health. You mentioned how you had no support, which I can also relate to, especially in school, as I have always navigated through my anxiety on my own and still do this. I have never reached out or considered accommodations. My only explanation for this is, again, to avoid that label. Do you think that labels in terms of mental illness and conditions are a negative or bad thing? No, no, not at all. I think that they can be positive, but in my own experience, I have always compared myself to those who did identify with certain labels pertaining to educational accommodations and thought that my experience or my struggles were not worthy of one. I think this also stemmed from the fact that my symptoms didn't affect interpersonal relationships or my ability to get good grades and therefore wasn't on my teacher's radar and a discussion was never had. This makes me think about the ways in which our school systems are set up where labels are often needed to get students the help they need. Should these labels be necessary in supporting our students? Great point, Jess. That reminds me of another part of the explanation of the exceptionality categories that didn't sit well with me. It was stated that the broad categories are meant to be inclusive of all medical conditions, whether diagnosed or not. The whether diagnosed or not section sounds like the Education Act is ensuring anyone who needs help is getting it. But that's not the case throughout my experience within the education system. Without the diagnosis or label, it could take years to get an IEP, which is sometimes the only way that a student can access the resources necessary to help them achieve success. You make a good point. This part of the explanation stood out to me as well. Even when students do go through the process of getting a diagnosis, in order to be considered for an IEP, it is incredibly lengthy and often expensive because of all the testing that has to take place, which is not realistic for a lot of students. There are also incredibly long wait lists depending on the student's needs. And then when students do finally get a diagnosis, they are placed within the same box, although their experiences could be vastly different and manifest themselves in different ways. And what if a student doesn't qualify for an IEP as they are not considered exceptional, but they still have specific needs? Would someone with anxiety qualify for an IEP? Is it necessary for a student to have an IEP in order for their needs to be accommodated? I'd argue no. The first step is knowing your students, their strengths, challenges, and interests, and figuring out the best way to engage them and make them feel important. But then that leads to the idea, how do you know that someone is struggling with an invisible disorder, like anxiety, if there is no explicit plan or program telling you what the student needs? Continuing with this idea, we had done some research in preparation for this podcast and came across a statement that makes reference to a child who is known as a dream student, but unbeknownst to the teacher, spends upwards of six hours daily doing homework to perfection, has trouble sleeping due to the fear of failure, and refuses to engage in any non-educational activities for fear it will rob them of essential learning opportunities. These students are also struggling with anxiety disorders. This really resonated with me as I remember these exact experiences as early as elementary school. To my teachers, I was totally a dream student, getting straight A's and always participating, but little did they know I was staying up all night to provide exemplary work. I can remember waking up surrounded by textbooks because I had fallen asleep with them, and I have carried these anxious habits with me throughout my education journey, still striving for perfection and often neglecting my body of essentials like food and sleep. Jess's example shows just how differently anxiety can manifest itself. Anxiety levels can fluctuate throughout the day and from day to day, making the symptoms and difficulties unpredictable and inconsistent. This makes it not only frustrating for the student experiencing it, but also the teacher who wants to help all their students to achieve their potential. Especially for what Jess just shared, how could a teacher possibly help? Good question, Jenny. Personally, I think that classroom culture and creating an open dialogue with my students that discusses mental health and creates comfort for my students in talking about their own experiences is a huge step towards supporting our students, especially those who are not given a label or have a diagnosis, as we've talked about. Students spend between 25 to 30 hours in school each week, and as teachers, we are in the position to play an essential role in identifying and assisting students in tackling their anxiety. Going back to teachers who do not have this as a firsthand experience, it is important that they become educated about what anxiety looks like in students within the classroom setting. In terms of instructional approaches, we need to give clear explanations and explicitly state expectations because this reduces the questioning, overthinking, and worrying that students may experience. 
I personally know that when an explanation for an assignment is vague, I become frustrated and overwhelmed that I am not doing what is expected of me instead of concentrating on demonstrating my learning. There needs to be a good balance between open instructions to allow for creativity and clear specific instructions. Another thing to consider is when and where the lessons are set up. Outdoor education should be implemented into the classroom at its, as it's been proven time and time again that connecting with nature is a great way to relieve stress and feel connected with oneself. It's also important to not overwhelm students with information. By building in body breaks, uh, this would allow for students to be physically active and get those endorphins up. One last very important suggestion is to ask your students what helps them to cope with stress. Develop a toolbox to use in your class when someone is feeling overwhelmed stressed or anxious and be explicit about how it is okay to feel these emotions and that you'll learn as a class to maneuver through them. Great points Jenny. One thing that does help me to cope with my own feelings of anxiety is yoga, meditation, and actively practicing mindfulness. This is something that I think should be incorporated into the classroom as well. Relating back to what is necessary for some is good for all. Well, listeners, that brings us to the end of our first episode of our Mindful Podcast. We're going to end it off with another breathing exercise. At the sound of the mindfulness bell, I want you to breathe in, inhaling for four seconds. Hold for four seconds. Exhale for four seconds. And hold again for four seconds. Thanks for listening. We hope that your mind is full of ideas as to how to deal with anxiety in the classroom. Stay mindful.